what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into our main segment today because El Diva Boyle has uh, things to do today. So we're going to thank you very much. <laughs> we're going to jump in. And so last week we finished assembly language part eight. I um, believe that was an unsigned number and no arithmetic shifts happened. However, we're going to do an, an ink A right now and we're going to increment to part nine, right? Yep, exactly. Okay, so we're going to increment this episode to part nine. Tom C. has just joined us from uh, Jersey. He's, uh, he's uh, Al Hartman's neighbor. All right, so we're incrementing the episode to Assembly Language Part 9, hosted by the author of Clowns and Balloons himself, Mr. Steve Bjork. And uh, I would also just like to say, look at that, we got Clowns and Balloons on the screen in living, <laughs> in living color. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to slightly correct you on that. James Guerin got credit for Clowns ah. and Balloons. See, he was uh, a programmer that assists me there at Datasoft. And Datasoft had this weird policy. Only one person can be listed for a product. Wow. And so I felt sorry for him after several products that he wasn't listen, listed on. So I gave him Clowns and Balloons and also Shooting Gallery. Ah, okay. So, so even, was, even though they were basically my games, I, I, I said he's got to get some credit because if this gig at Data Software goes south, he's got to have some credits here. Sure, sure. Well, that was... Are we going to have the DEF COM thing up? Uh, you know, I don't think there's a need for that. I yeah, we know that... he's going to lose it this time. Let's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... have other thoughts on that. And so what I'll do is I'll just zoom in like this, and you can look at the veins in my temples here, and if they start throbbing, <laughs> like the guy in Star Trek, those big brainiac throbbing vein head guides, right. if I start looking like that, then... Well, the, the question is, well, see, I kind of wanted the death con thing so that I know that if I'm getting two technicals or too many acronyms or something like that i know i gotta back off yeah and then uh, that's at which point i pile on but uh, yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> where's james where's james different after when we need him we can have the trifecta of tech battle here my we head will early explode. alerts <laughs> yep. We'll have I need to, to wear, you guys alerts I, there when I, Steve yeah I need to I need to wear one of these medical bracelets here saying that my head explodes during techno babble I'm allergic to it <laughs> you think we can get a presidential tweet to everybody to let them know when uh, you know, yes yes yeah well uh, let's see why don't we go ahead and get that slide up there for everybody to see this is a little different than what we've done in the past we've been talking about instructions oh all the lovely instructions in the 6809 and by the way we're still not done there's a few leftover instructions we haven't covered but by golly we've got to now talk about addressing modes dressing modes is the real power the the the, the um, thing that turns the 6809 into a superhero it really is what makes the 6809 shine compared to the other 8 slash 16 bit processors back in the day. And what, why don't we go to the first slide? Basically, what an addressing mode is, is the way the 6809 is going to address its information, the way it's going to go and grab it. And that's one of the beauties of the 6809. There is a multitude of ways to do it. I've always said with the 6809, it's never trying to figure out some way to get the 6809 to do the way you, you know, to do something you want to do. It's just trying to find one, the better ways to do it. It doesn't fight you. And that, that was the beauty. And that's what I really loved about Kodi on this processor. It's like, Oh, we could do it this way, or we could get that information that way, or we could go around this way. So it, it it's actually kind of good for a beginnings programmer to actually use the 6809 because you don't have to work so hard like the 6502. You have to use tricks like, um, uh, oh, let's say you go through and you want to address something quickly or you want to be able to have some flexibility in the way you do addressing, you have to use self-modifying code. There's just no way around it on that processor. I will add, I actually took a, a machine language course in university for second year, and the course book we had, the two main processors they concentrated on was the 6809 and then the 68000 because they were showing you the difference between the 8 and 16 bits, and that was the two they chose as the basis for teaching. And I think they had a PDP-11 in there too because the 6809 has some, you know, cousin relationships with it as far as addressing modes go. 
And that's the thing is the 6809 was being developed essentially at the same time as the 68,000. So they were putting a lot of the effort of this newer, more powerful 68,000 chip. They're going, well, we've kind of learned it for a th few things. Let's put on the 6809 too. So it, when I moved over to doing stuff on the Sega Genesis, it was a breeze to go from 6809 to 68,000. And of course, it was a true 16 slash 32 bit processor that really allowed you to get a, work, a lot of work done. But we're here to talk about the 6809 and like that. And as I put down here as a reference at the bottom, hold on, Stevie, this is going to be a bumpy ride. Okay. Yeah. All righty. We've talked about some of these addressing modes in our past. Uh, seminars. Um, some of them are very straightforward. In the case of the increment A, that's the INCA, the register A is the addressing mode here. Basically, this is, you know, it's kind of built into the instruction. It says, whatever we're going to work at, we're going to be working on the A register. In the case of the INC A, it adds one to A. And some of the other ones are INC B, uh, decrement A, decrement B, clear A, clear B, complement A, complement B. As I said, what it works on is in the instruction. Uh, these are typically one byte instructions. They run very quick. And that's one of the reasons why you see them a lot in the programs is they're useful, they're quick, they're fast, they get the job done. But it, this inherent, this addressing mode that's called inherent basically means that we're addressing something that is inherent in the way the instruction is named. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're keeping um, CV here at DEF CON 1, I can see. I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Immediate addressing means that the address is part of the instruction. Next is that supposed to switch lines? Okay, switch lines. Yep. Yeah. So let's, let's switch lines. Okay. Okay. The instruction actually holds the data to be used. It's inside there. A good example of this is add to A the number 16. It's a two byte instruction. The first byte is the actual command of add to A, and the second byte holds the number 16. So we're basically saying that the information in this addressing mode is immediate. It is part of the instruction. It's very quick and it's also used quite a bit too um, throughout uh, the 6809. So if you want to add a number to D or you're, you want to load a number into the X register, these are all immediate. It's part of the instruction. And if you're not doing self-modifying code, it never changes. Now, because the A register is an 8-bit register, it's automatically going to assume whatever you're feeding into, it's not bigger than 8 bits. So you don't have to worry about an overflow or a state or anything else like that, right? Well, you don't have to worry about the fact that you're trying to add a 16-bit number. In other words, a, a word, two bytes to a 8-bit 8 8-bit number. Now, there's also the add to D, which is a 16-bit. And it'll actually grab both of those bytes for that from within the instruction. So, <clears throat> and it, basically it just means that the information is part of the instruction. Okay. Very quick, very fast. Uh, it's not going to go, I have to look somewhere else in memory to find it. It's right there. So it's immediate. It kind of sounds like its name. Yep. All right. If we're good on that, let's move to the next slide. Yep. Extended addressing is where with inside the instruction is the 16-bit pointer. And remember, with 16 bits, which is two bytes or a word, you can point to any place that the 1609 can reference. And they call this extended addressing because within the instruction, we have two bytes. They're referring to where we're going to find the information in the full 64K of memory. And let's see, an example of this is load A with dollar sign FF02. This means load up A with the contents that is at hexadecimal FF02. So it basically loads A with the data that is at this IO port. 
in the COCO, for example, FF02 is an I.O. port. It talks to information outside the computer through this little chip, and that gets put into the A register. Doing okay there, Stevie? Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Not too many acronyms there. No. Nope. Uh, let's, let's stay on that slide, though. Okay. Uh, a couple more things. Just want to really emphasize. The address to talk to this memory, you know, to figure out where the memory location is, is definitely inside the instruction again. Before, the information that was inside the instruction was the physical data. Here, the difference is this is the address of the physical data. So it's actually got to do a lookup on what's in that location to load it yes. into there. Exactly. Yeah. It's a little slower because mm -hmm. it has to figure out the address, go look for a memory, and come back with the data. It's but basically the, like saying doing a peek from this location and then... Yep. Yeah. Yep. In the case now, of a load, yes. Yep. And, of course, one of the nice things about this is you're not having to waste a register to point to this location. It, it's just part of the instruction. There are times that you're going to want to have uh, a register point to someplace, but this makes it very quick to load up something that's sitting in memory without having to waste a register. And registers, while we do have a few on the 6809, it's not like the uh, 68,000 where we got 16 of them. You know, it's just, we don't have a lot of registers to waste. Okay. So this, that's really why this extended addressing, and it's pretty common in most processors to have this extended addressing mode where the location that you want to grab the data is sitting as part of the instruction. Let's yeah. go to the next slide now. I'll just add to the, like the load A example we've got here where it's getting, you know, whatever stored at memory location FF02 is equivalent of a peak. If you're doing a store to a memory location, it's equivalent of a poke. Mm -hmm. exactly. So if that was an STA, that would be store A? Yep. yep. Exactly. Whatever is okay. an A gets stored at whatever memory location you tell it to. All right. Now, one thing about doing this is you have to have within the instruction two bytes that talk about the address of what we're doing with the extended addressing. And that can make the program a little larger. It can make it slightly slower. As I said, it's got to load up the entire address from the actual instruction. So it always makes the instruction two bytes longer. Well, when they were developing the 6800 and the folks that did the 6502, they liked the idea. Something that was developed called direct addressing. It's basically a, a shorthanded version of extended addressing. Now, in the earlier processors, it would simply say, oh, direct addressing. Um, you've got a 16-bit address. The top half of that 16-bit address is always going to be zero. And within the instruction, we're going to carry the lower eight bits of the address. So it only makes the instruction one byte longer. And since it doesn't have to do that low to the upper byte, it knows it's going to be zero. Hey, that means it'll be a little quicker. So it and shorter. And shorter. So this actually makes the program shorter and run a little faster. Now, the guys that developed the 6809 said, hey, let's make it more flexible and call it direct page and include a register that will hold what those upper eight bits are, the upper half of the instruction. So you can literally move your direct page anywhere in memory as long as you're doing in steps of 256 bytes. Every 256 bytes, you can have a new direct page yeah. just by loading up the register. I, so, I will mention the 6502, actually, if I remember correctly, they referenced it as zero page, because literally you can yeah. only have it at zero. So, and, and then direct page with the 6809 adding the DP register, the direct page register that points to the upper was so much more flexible because now you could you know, move it to wherever you needed, you know, some speed and base savings. Uh, OS 9 uses it extensively for your loading different processes because everybody gets their own direct page. It doesn't interfere with each other's. If you only had one zero page, every every process or thread or whatever would have to keep track of exactly who's doing what so I don't overwrite something somebody else did. 
Yeah, it, it really made this processor be flexible. It made it a user, a multi-user, multitasking operating system. But the real emphasis here is this is a way to create a shorthand. At the beginning of your program, you set the direct page to where you want your direct page variables, where you want these shorthand variables to be at. Most programmers just set, set the direct page to zero and just use the first 256 bytes for the direct page. But as I said, you have the option to move it anywhere. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see an example where if we had set direct page to one, instead of in our example, which was looking at memory location 71, he is now gonna look at memory location 171X because it's getting that one from the direct page register and the 71 is from the program. So the main emphasis here is direct page or what was called zero page processing is a way to do a shorthand to talk to just 256 bytes of RAM and get in there quick and like that. So a lot of important variables in your program get stored in direct page, things that you're gonna constantly access all the time. So like mm -hmm. if you wanted to have the count of number of lives, which we know we have to basically extend for Stevie lots of time, <laughs> <laughs> we would store the current life count in direct page. It makes it fast, it makes it quick for accessing. All the different parts of the program can access it. It's a convenient way to get your important variables down. Yeah, and in so. Steve's case, we would put the uh, level number he's on in extended page because it's slower and it doesn't get access as much because he never gets past level two. So, <laughs> so. I, I want to mention one other thing too, just a, a real life example. The patches I've been doing to rescue on fractals, which I've got about running 10 to 20% faster now. There's chunks of the program that do the calculations for the 3D terrain mapping, and then there's calculations that actually do the drawing of the 3D mapping, which is a multi-layered thing as it builds out from the back of the screen, like as far back into the screen as you can go up to your right in front of you. And one of the patches I did that did speed it up is that those chunks are done separately. So it does all this math calculation for fractals. It takes a huge amount of code, and then it's got a whole bunch for the drawing. And I just changed the direct page between those two. So I think it was five and seven in, in that particular case where all the calculations for the one type are in five and all the calculations for the other type are in seven. So I managed to shorten the code and speed it up just doing that. Mm -hmm. So how are we doing with direct page here for you, Stevie? Uh, it's, I'm fine right now. Okay. So think of it as a shorthand or quickie way to get to variables. Mm -hmm. Don't have a lot of them, but the important ones you'll want to put there to make your program run faster. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, let's go to the next slide. All right, this is where it starts getting a little bumpy because it is the superpower of the 6809. Index addressing. And at this point, we're gonna spend almost all of the rest of the um, session here on index addressing. Um, as you know, there are four main index registers, the X, Y, S, which is the stack pointer and the U, which is the user stack pointer. The program counter can also be used as an index register in some of the uh, types we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. But um, the main ones we're talking about here are X, Y, S, and U. They're all 16-bit, so they can all point to anywhere in the 64K of the Cocos memory. And indexing, like you would think about your index cards, you go through and you got a whole bunch of cards and where you're looking at in those cards, that's your index point. That's the point you're at. But the thing is the 1609 lets you say, hey, I can go forward three cards or I can go back five cards. And the interesting way it works is that you're able to kind of like keep that pointer like you have your index finger inside the card stuff, you know, so you don't forget that point and you can just move back three cards and look at something there. And when you're done looking at it, you, you still got your finger pointing in that index card list. So you know where you're at. 
So this is where we're going to get into the stuff is that's it. Think about index cards, your finger in the middle of the index where you want to make your reference and how you can go backwards and forwards. Okay. That's what we're going to be doing. Let's go to the next slide. I think last week the stock in uh, buffets and uh, especially Golden Corral went up talking about the plate analogy. So now hopefully the index card uh, industry will take a little spike now after this one. Dewey Decimal cards are back. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes, they are. There are definitely many ways to use the index registers since these registers are all 16-bit. I was kind of covering that a little bit with the analogy of the uh, card index. Uh, they can point to anywhere. And as I say, this is the true power of the 16 line is because there's many options to use them. And this is where the power comes in, where I keep saying it's not. The 16 line is not trying to find a way to do something. It's finding the best way to do something. And don't worry too much about the way you're doing it when you're first coding is the best way. You'll learn as you're going through what is the best way. Right now, we just want to get it done without a problem, without bugs. Yeah. As a beginning programmer, the best way to do indexing is whatever's easiest for you to understand and keep track of. Right. Later on, you can worry about optimizing for speed and size and a bunch of other things when you start learning some of the tricks, but they're definitely more complicated to keep track of. So if we don't want you to DEFCON 5 right off the bat here, we want to keep it on the the KISS principle. Exactly. And when we get down to one of the the later slides, that's when we're definitely going up one uh, DEFCON level for sure. So it'll be good to know, but don't have to necessarily try and use it right away. Let's go to the next slide. Well, in that card analogy that I used, um, basically referencing to where your finger is sticking in that uh, stack of cards, that list of cards, that's the easiest way to refer to something is where you're already at. And that's basically offset zero. This basically means where the index or register is pointing. That's where you're going to get your information. And let's see, basically that can be referred to as a load A with zero comma X, or it could be just simply load A with comma X. If you don't have anything before the comma, the default is it's zero. It means where X is pointing. Now, the index off the... um, The zero offset off the register is very quick because the instruction knows you're not adding anything to it. You just want to point there. And so it only really adds one byte to the instruction, just telling it we're index zero. All addressing modes have at least one byte added to them. You got the instruction, and then you got the thing that says the type of index you're doing. Remember before with direct page, you had the instruction, then you had which one of the direct page uh, memory locations you're going to, and that was one byte. This is, there's one byte that says, we're doing this type of instruction. It's very fast, very quick. When a programmer can use it, they like to use it a lot, right, Curtis? Oh, yeah. When you're, and it's just like when you're in that index card, you got your finger in the slot. It's very easy to look right there and see it. 16 online likes it like that. Let's go to the next slide. The next one has to do with a constant offset. This is where, remember I talked about, you keep your finger pointed at one spot in all that list of cards, Mm -hmm. but you want to go three backwards. This is where it comes in, or four backwards, or four ahead. That information about how far to move back, how far to go forward, that's included inside the instruction. It does not change unless you do self-modifying code. So it allows you to simply keep a finger, which is the, let's say in this case, the x register, keep in the same location, move forward four cards. That's what the load A four comma X is. Load A at the fourth card down. And you get the information. And of course the beauty is your finger is still in that 
uh, card stack. It hasn't moved. In other words, the X register hasn't been changed or updated. It stays the same. So it allows you to sit there and grab something from memory, but four bytes later, or a hundred bytes later, or a thousand bytes before just depending on how you want to get the information out of there. An example that we might use something 32 bytes later on a Coco Model 1, 2 screen that is and developed, it's got 32 bytes of memory per scan line. So if you want to look at something exactly one scan line down, you would say 32 comma X, 32 bytes later than where X is pointing. So you could see this gets used quite a bit for graphic modes yeah. and and stuff like that. I'll throw in one other example, uh, more to Steve's you know gaming persona. Um, let's say X is pointing to a, a, a block of data describing an alien ship or something like that. You might have zero comma X is the alien's X position on the screen. One comma X might be the alien's Y position on the screen. Two comma X might be what kind of an alien you're drawing, like like you did in your game Cosmic Aliens where you have multiple aliens. So basically, you would load X point to whatever alien you're currently working on. So if you have five of them, you would have five different locations that you could load an X, and then you'd have these little offsets within the kind of these tables. And I'm done. You know, Steve's going to get more into this with the object-oriented stuff later. But basically, you can use that just to constant reference, and then you don't have to figure out, you know, alien one is stored here and alien two is stored here, and I got to do the multiplications to figure out where about this information will be. You just point to the start of each one, and then these constant offsets, you can just grab those variables right straight off. Hopefully, it's not confusing for you, Stevie. Yeah. And, okay. And, and we'll definitely get in that because object-oriented coding allows you to have the same code work on different guys. And you could have like three balls bouncing on the screen. And the only thing different between the three different balls bouncing on the screen is their data. They don't have to, because if you had hard-coded, that's the term we use, hard-coded their information in direct page, you would have to have a different routine for each one of those balls because they would be looking at a different place in direct page to find that information. So it'll it'll be a technique that I definitely will be, te be teaching everybody early on in the assembly language course that goes for writing more efficient code, less buggy code, and uh, just generally a more pleasurable way of doing things. Much, much easier to keep track of stuff, yes. <laughs> exactly. But still, you, you got the idea that this allows you to talk to, say, the fourth card down from where you're pointing inside mm -hmm. that index list. Right, okay. Stevie? Yeah. Okay. So we're doing good. We still got you at DEF CON 5, right? Yep. Okay. Oh, I plan to change that later. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one point where we might shave a, 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 a half a point off of that, bring you up slightly. Constant, con, constant offset in dressing mode um, has three different options, three different ways of doing it. And it all depends about how far away from where you're pointing in the index list do you want to go. Let's say that you just want to go back about eight cards that could be done very simply with the first type of offset. It has to do with a sine four bit offset, which allows you to go back 16 one way, negative 16, or a positive 15. The second way of doing it is a sine seven bit offset, which allows you to go 128 backwards or negative, or 127 forward. So you can see we're, we've got a we got a pretty long card cattle here, where mm -hmm. you know we can go, you know, more than a hundred cards backwards and forwards. But let's say that's not enough. Let's say that you've got one of these um, ones you'd see in a comedy movie where you pull out the card index and it's about um, oh I don't know, thirty or forty feet long. Mm -hmm. It literally holds sixty four thousand cards. Well, where X is pointing, you can move backwards and forwards a negative 32,768 to a positive 32,767, which is a sine 16-bit offset. So you can move all the way through memory that you want. Now, why would you do three of these? And why would they 
be set up with these ranges? Uh, probably just for efficiency. If you don't need to go too far, why waste the processing time? Or Exactly. Bingo. Exactly. Each one of these different modes adds an extra byte. As I said, all indexing operations require at least one byte to say what type of indexing it is. And then in the case of the one where we're looking at assigned seven bit mode, that adds an extra byte. And the last one adds a two extra bytes to figure it out. So it, And they it, get slower the bigger you get too. It gets slower because it's got to do more calculations and it's got to load the data. Now here's something interesting. I kept on saying something about all the indexing modes are at least one byte in size. And one of the things that they figured out in the 6809 is we're going to have to do a lot of references close to where we're pointing. And they had just enough room when they're figuring out all the different addressing modes that they could put inside that byte that says what addressing mode we're doing. We could put five bits or in something that actually does assign four bit operation to go negative 16 to a positive 15 within that byte. It was very complicated for them to do it. It was very hard to work out. We're thankful they did because it allows us this very special mode. So that's uh, basically the different styles and why you got it right on the nose. It has to do with efficiency. The first one's most efficient because we're not going to add anything to it to figure out this constant index off of it. The next one, we add just one byte. And for in the case of the uh, six, signed 16 bit, we add two bytes. So, yeah, it's all about efficiency. Now, in the case that I give here, the load A with 32, comma X, gee, could that be the next scan line in the video buffer? Anyways, that would require one byte added to the instruction for the sign seven bit offset. Where if we had said uh, four comma X, it would have just been a single byte instead of two bytes there. Okay, how are we doing there, Stevie? Bytes or bits? 32 is four, four bytes? Well, no, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I confuse them back and forth. Um, yeah, 32 would add one byte. Yeah, it would fall into that second one, the negative 120 to positive 127 range, because that's beyond mm -hmm. a plus 15. Right. Yep. So it would, add, it would add the one byte and slow okay. it down slightly. Yeah, you lose one CPU cycle on that one. I think you lose two to three or something on the 16-bit. I can't remember the exact yeah. offset. But. Yeah, the, the, um, that's one thing to keep in mind. When we start working sometimes with... Uh, information that's three two bit uh, excuse me 16 bits in size two bytes it the cpu kind of has to do things twice a little bit so it really slows it down but still we've got these efficiencies in here and once again these offsets to the x register the y register do not change or affect um the register itself. The yeah. register itself. Yeah, it's it's it it's still you got your finger still in the card index pointing while you're looking somewhere else, and yet gotcha. you know it's still there. It's still pointing that location. So it's 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 definitely a very powerful type of operation. It's used quite a bit in the 69 coding, as you can see the uh, uh, 32x comma four uh, definitely. Um, helps. Let's move to the next slide if we're doing okay there. Mm -hmm. Now, you can also do this type of operation where you have a, you know, a constant offset with the program counter. And this is typically used to talk to like, hey, I want to load up um, the address of a data table, or I want to make reference of, of some information somewhere else. And but that information is part, kind of part of the program. It makes it so that I can point to it and it's what we call PC relative, a program counter relative. It makes sure that if I move the program and I, move, I can move the data with it, it will know where the data is. 
but it's 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 a way to reference information but when they did this particular mode there is no smaller negative 16 to positive 15 offset it's just strictly the 7 bit offset and the 15 bit offset the signed offsets okay I'm looking so, at a byte or a word there for this yeah exactly so not yeah you, know, you can't get as efficient as what the index registers allow for but at least you still have this option where you can index off the PC register. And there are some handy times for that. But just making a, you everybody aware of this mode exists and we will be using it in much later lessons. Next slide. Sometimes when we go through and we want to, we put the finger in, we might have to do a calculation to figure out where we want to offset from. And of course, we know that the A and B registers can be used for 8-bit calculations and the D register can be used for 16-bit calculations. A good example for this is, let's say for ex that you want to talk to the 20th line, or no, let's just say the 10th line of video memory. Well, you would use the A, B, and D registers the following. You would load up A with the fact that you are the number 10, the 10th line, um, or whatever you're referring to. The B register you would load up with the number of bytes. Uh, per line. Per line. And you could use the multiply command that would multiply A and B uh, together. And you would now be looking at the number 320 in the D register. As remember, the D register is the A and B register put together to make a total of 16 bits. And we can use that as an offset. So if you sit there and say load A with D comma X, you would now be loading information off the 10th line. So you can see we can do calculations to figure out where we want to offset to. And that's what uh, this particular type of indexing is all about. Now remember, this indexing is either assigned 7-bit or assigned 15-bit. In other words, it can go negative or positive. Okay. So, as I, you know, and if you need to refer back to it in one of the previous lessons, we talked about math and how the sign works and like that. Okay. Doing okay there? Yep. All right. Next slidey. All right. Sometimes, if you're pointing somewhere in that card index, it would nice to be able to automatically move the pointer when we look to the card. Let's say you look at the card and you say, nope, that's not the book I want. You take your index pointing finger and you move it to the next card. And that allows you to remind that the next time you're looking at that index card list, that you're now looking at this one instead of the previous one. This is typical if you wanted to uh, write a bunch of information to graphics memory because you're going to be moving along. You write information to the memory location and then you want to move the pointer to the next one. So the next time you go through that loop, that next instruction, whatever, the X is now pointing to the next location that you want to talk to. And that's where we come into auto increment and auto decrement. Remember okay. increment A where we add one? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing is in processors, we do a lot of just adding ones to things. So we have an auto increment, auto decrement. For the most part, it's adding one to the index register. And yes, Curtis, I will cover the exception. <laughs> okay. I was also yeah. going to mention like uh, an excellent example of this is just clear the screen. If yep. you want to clear the text screen with zero, you would do store A, you'd load A with zero first, and then you'd do store A X plus after pointing X to the start of the screen. And then you just keep it in a loop and you check to see when you're done the screen. It would just keep incrementing X. So store A X plus, it would start at, say, 1024. The next time would be 2025. The next would be 1026. And you could basically yeah. open the whole screen. Well, see, the reason why they do this is one of the most common things that people do in other processors is that after they store the information somewhere, they then have an instruction that increments or adds one to that pointer. So the beauty of it is in one instruction, You've you, done do, both. you do both. You do what most processors do in two instructions. All right, so store is like a poke. 
Yep. Store is so like this, a poke. So this is basically saying poke X comma what's in value A and then X equals X plus one, but it's saying that all in one statement. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. That's all there's to it. It allows you to move. Now, this is the first instruction that actually changes the index register. See, all those other ones, we've left the finger pointing in that index card list and not moved it, even though we looked at things that were somewhere else. This one actually changes it and causes it to move forward by one. Let's go to the next slide if we're doing okay. Mm -hmm. All right. What if you're trying to read or write a 16-bit number? That's two bytes. If you did something like store X, um, Y plus one, it would only move the index register one byte. That doesn't work for 16-bit numbers where there are two bytes. So they have an auto increment that moves forward by two bytes. And you can see here, we've got a store X, Y plus plus. That's how you tell the microprocessor not to move once, but move twice. Now I'm saying here that it's basically adding two to two. I mean, adding two to Y. I made a mistake there. I put the X. That's supposed to be the Y register. Eh, something for me to correct on these slides. Anyways, you must use the right number of pluses when you're writing your code. A store A plus plus will store the data at every other byte of memory because it will increment twice. If you do a store A uh, plus, it will work with writing to every byte of memory. So it's up to you as the programmer to decide and remember to use either increment once or increment twice based on the number of pluses. And by the way, the processor, the way it really does it is it writes one byte increments, writes the second byte, and then increments again, essentially. So yeah, it, takes, it, takes cycles. it takes cycles to do this. Exactly. Because yeah. you're writing two bytes, it takes two cycles, and like that. But, you know, the whole idea here was to make it so you don't have to use two instructions. You're combining them into one, and it makes it a little faster. And once you get used to it, easier to write code. Yeah, and saves room too, because otherwise you have literally two instructions. You have to do a story comma y, which take, takes a couple of bytes, and then, and then, you have and then to do ink add two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it speeds it up, makes the program shorter. Everybody's happy, and then we thank the designers of the six eight zero nine for doing that. All right. As I said, in the case of like x plus and x x two, it moves the pointer. But when does it? It does it afterwards. We call this post auto increment. It means that it stores the information or reads the information or whatever it's going to do. Then it moves the pointer. Well, we also have, as I said before, auto decrement. It works backwards. It does the decrementing before it reads or write using the pointer. In other words, the pointer changes first by the decrement. And then it points to the location you're going to pull up the information. That makes sense, Stevie? Yep. Yeah. Now I'm going to try to preemptively assume, is there a double minus if you want to do two bytes? Yep. Yep. There is okay. two. Yeah. There is two if you want to do two. But um, that's known as a double negative. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you would think that, oh, then we will increment. No, 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 no. But the most important thing to say here is the fact that in the auto increment, it happens afterwards automatically. Basically, after the instruction, it is now pointing to the new location. In the case of the um, auto decrement, it's a pre decrement, it happens before the register gets used. So it'll decrement and then do the read or write to memory. Then in a case of a double decrement, it'll then decrement again and then use memory. So that's another reason why we put the minus sign before the index register. If we notice 
won't yes, work. Yes, yeah, because that that's telling you visually that it's happening yes. first, where the plus is at the end, it's showing you visually it's happening after. And the exactly. assembler, if you do it bad, if you do it wrong, it will actually air out. So okay. it helps you catch this if you, you and okay. it triggers your brain to remember which way it's working. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and much like the um, where we had the single and double pluses, you must remember to use the single or double pluses whether you're writing a byte at a time or a word at a time, which is two bytes. You got to remember that, or else when you start doing this uh, stuff, you're going to get weird graphics on the screen or other weird effects in the program. But once again. You know, you don't have to use this auto increment and auto decrement in the beginning. You can do it as two separate instructions if it makes it easier for you to program and understand your code. Mm -hmm. So, it, or if it, you're coming it, from a six five zero two, and that's pretty well all you have. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Or else you, do, or else you do self modifying code. Let's put it this way: if you want to do anything the sixty five zero two, you pretty much are writing self modifying code. All right. If we're okay there, Stevie, I know we. Mm -hmm. it, this is one of the ones that can get a little bumpy. No, so far so good. All right. Okay, I lost the bet so far. We'll see if Steve, Steve wins. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, and just to kind of reiterate everything we talked about here, you know, the two types of auto decrementing are the single minus and the double minus that come in front of the X. And they're basically, you know, if you got two of them, it is going to subtract two, but they're done if, in one step at a time. And the reason why they did it this way, it mimics, it mimics the way the stack works in the computer. Remember that pushing down plates and pulling things up mm -hmm. that we talked about in a previous lesson? Well, yeah. that's the way the stack works is the way this auto incrementing works. It does the increment afterwards when you pull it off the stack but when you're pushing it down you're storing the information on the stack it does the decrement first so there is a reason why they do these differently is just so that it can mimic the way the stack operations work too and in fact you do you sometimes use these on the stack if you if you push some stuff in the stack and you only want to we don't want to go to death count three we do not want to go to death okay Darn. Yeah. Well, it might help somebody win a bet. <laughs> <laughs> I already lost, so I, I oh, have no Oh, I've got a screen right here that's going to send you for a loop, unless I can explain it well. But not quite yet. Well, we're almost there. Remember in one of our previous lessons, we talked about... Am I, am I advancing slides, next, or are you just next, still... Next, next, okay. next slide. Next slide. All right. All right. In the... Um, 6809, we've got more one more indexing trip up the sleeve. And it's we kind of touched upon it already with the on X go to that we tried to emulate from basic in the 6809. That was the jump with a bracket B comma X bracket. This told it to jump to where it to use the data in the jump that it found at B comma X. This is so you could have a bunch of tables that said where you go. This is known as extended indirect addressing and it's available on virtually all the different addressing modes. So every addressing mode that we talked about here, you could sit there and say where the index car, where you got your finger in the end index uh, thing. And then if we skip forward and now we found the card that we're actually looking at, it had that Dewey decimal number on it. And it told you where, based on a Dewey de decimal number, you could find it in the bookshelf. That's what extended indirect addressing. It allows you to sit there and say, I'm not actually pointing to the data. I'm actually pointing to where you will find, you know, the information about where to find the data. The pointer to the pointer. Exactly. So you we're we're going up one step in the meta. Meta. Okay. We are are we send, we're now looking at the information on the card that has the Dewey decimal number that tells us where in the bookshelf to find the book. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. And, the, and the indirect modes are always designated by those square brackets. So if you're using extended indirect or indexed indirect or any of these other ones here, the square brackets are what are telling you and telling the assembler that that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, we're, we're, we're now saying what you're looking at isn't the final place. We're going to grab that information and that information is going to tell us where in the hell to find that book. So, okay. Okay. So it's a, a it's a it's a card that points to another card, and on that you, card is where we're going. Right. Yep. Okay. Now the reason okay. why we do this in the six eight zero nine is so you don't have to waste time loading up another register with that data. You would find at BCom X, and then having to load up that data and going somewhere. So we're actually able to combine not only two instructions and one here so we could get to that book but the fact that we don't have to waste a register doing it and not to the, mention multiple instructions multiple instruction so it makes the code faster it makes it simpler you're you're not having to waste your limited number of index registers to find that location so this is where the power of the 6809 really shines is the ability to do this rather complicated have a pointer with a finger inside the card rex in, in card index move to someplace relative to it to look up the card information to find the dewey decimal number to actually find the book on the shelf and this helps a lot in a lot of the programming we're going to be doing later but it is very, it's one of the keys. It's a literally superpower. Now, okay. now, as I said before, there's a couple of addressing modes this does not work with. And that is when you do an auto increment or decrement by one. And it makes sense. You're looking at 16 bits, two bytes of data. You don't want to increment by one you'd only go halfway through the address. So you have to use auto increment or decrement by two. That's where we had the two plus signs mm -hmm. or the two minus signs. So that's, that is one restriction. Other than that, it's available. This auto, th this, this uh, indirect addressing is available on all the different uh, index Indexing addressing right modes. Yeah, it's yeah. available. And, and the main reason for that not allowing the the single and, and single increment single decrement is because these are pointers to pointers and a pointer is pointing to 64k so you need two bytes to tell it where to go to find whatever data you're trying to look up so having the single plus minus just would not make sense because you would not be able to point to the actual location yep and if anybody remembers dewey decimal systems just like a 16-bit pointer which is two bytes which is kind of a long bit of information uh, so can that Dewey Decimal number be? I remember having to write it down many times <laughs> trying to find the book. I was oh. just going to mention, if you remember Dewey Decimal, you're old, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I do that's... remember it. I do remember it, so I used it. <laughs> hey, it was the only way to find something in the university. But, uh, okay, so are we doing here good, Stevie? So far, so good. Nobody's winning a bet. Okay. I didn't even get you to DEFCON 4, huh? Nope. Next slide. Yeah. The next slide, and I pretty much already covered that in what I was saying. You don't need to load up a register to look up the address for somewhere else using this indirect in, I mean, indirect, extended indirect addressing. And it speeds up looking up data tables. It, it's, uh, data tables are something we're going to definitely get into when we talk about using uh, the 6809 as part of actually writing code and programs. But data tables are very important. I like that. Let's go to the next slide. One term that I've been avoiding using because Stevie doesn't like acronyms <laughs> <laughs> is effective addressing. I just have an acronym per slide quota. No more yeah. than three, no more than three, three letter acronyms per slide. That's why you don't like David Labs. <laughs> I, I got it now. Okay. And this is only two letters, so okay. it's a little easier and you can't spell a foul word with them. Oh, electronic arts, EA. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 Motorola should too. <laughs> okay, you're back at the um, index card register. You got your finger in there, and you're using that zero offset, and your finger's pointing in there. That is the effective address. That is where we're going. If you were to say that you wanted to look backwards four cards, that is the effective address because it's where your main finger is pointing and then four cards back. So that's the term we use for whenever the 6809 is basically going to point to a location in memory to get its data is the effective address. And we also have an instruction called load effective address in the 6809 that works with these modes. And this is where it gets a little bumpy. Okay. Um, just to kind of show you briefly, the load effective address can be used to load into the X, Y, U, and S register. There's 16 bit pointers. It's a way to take the effective address and move it into one of your index registers. That's essentially what we're doing. So it's load effective address in X, Y, U, and S. There is no load effective address for the PC register, the program counter. Okay. It can be used in the reference, but there is no LEA PC. But you can definitely load up any one of the four standard index registers using the load effective address load effective address command. And on the next slide, we've got some examples. Let's say that you want to use your data pointer called data table a lot. You want a register to point to it and use references to it. Well, load effective address um, data table comma PC will allow you to get that data register and table and load it into the extra register. Because what it's saying is we've calculated effective address that's data, data table comma PC. And we're now transferring into the extra register. The next one will make much more sense. Load effect, effective address 32 comma X. That means- Am I on the wrong slide? Okay. Uh, yeah, go to yeah. the next slide. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. Uh, the next example I've got here is load effective address 32 comma X. Well, remember before X is pointing those cards, we skip ahead 32 cards. We have a new effective address of whatever X has plus 32, and that's now moved into the X register. We effectively just added the number 32 to X. Okay. And it's still with me. Load effective address of X. Uh -huh. You're basically saying stick into X, whatever is 32 bytes forward. Yep. Of X. Yeah, it's it's yep. basically X equals X plus or X equals 32 plus X. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's a way to sit there and add numbers to index registers. If you want to move it 32 bytes, this, you know, the, which this, would be a text scan line or even a graphic scan line for this. Case exactly. Here. Right. So I want to move okay. down one line. So if I'm drawing a line from the top of the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, I could use this 32 comma X to move one scan line. Okay. It's a very, quick whatever the effective address was, which would be like wherever in memory your screen was, for example, yeah. your text yeah. screen or your graphic screen. Right. right. It, it, it's a very easy way to add numbers to an index register. Uh, the next one, uh, by the way, in all operations of the processor, uh, you're sitting there saying load up this uh, X register with 32 comma X, wouldn't it get confused? No, the, the actual transfer of information to the X register happens after the instruction is completed. So, X gets 32 added to it, then gets transferred into X. So the next one, load effective address X m minus X. That does the auto decrementing to X. And 
you know, it, it, it basically is doing a decrement to X. This type of instruction is put in here so you could use X as a counter. Uh, so let's say that it was a fairly large number, let's say like um, the size of the screen, you know, which is over 6K. You could load up X with the size of the screen. You do load effective address minus X and it will auto decrement. It will sit there and subtract one from X. You could have also said uh, load effective address uh, minus one comma X too. Both of these will cause the X register to subtract by one. So you're now able to use the X register, not only as an index register, but as a counting register for a loop. Handy if you got something that's bigger than 256 uh, steps. Yep. yep. Yeah. So this is a way to to um, to use it for counting. So these are just three simple examples of load effective address. And, and um, you can get much more sophisticated because you your your register that you're using to calculate whatever you're putting into whatever register that you've picked for the LEA instruction itself can be different registers. You can have uh, LEAX 32 comma Y. Mm -hmm. Basically means x equals y plus thirty-two. So you're yep. actually doing additions between completely different things and putting them into a new register. Thank you, Curtis. That's that's a point that I kind of skipped here. But yeah, it is. It, it's a very powerful command. You could actually load off where the stack pointer is pointing using this. You can get all sorts sorts of information moved around. Now, it should be noted that only the load effective address x and load effective uh, address Y operations will affect the zero flag. See, like if you did like added two numbers together in the A register and the answer became zero, the zero flag would get set. Well, the load effective address X and Y's affect the zero flag. So if we're using the example I have here of load effective address negative X and I'm using it for counting down, See, when we reach zero, what happens? Our zero flag gets set. So it allows it to work very good. Now, otherwise, none of the condition codes, things like negative or carrier or these other condition code flags will be affected by this instruction. So it lets us use it for counting. That's mostly what it's used for if we're trying to do something that requires you know, a lot of steps like the wiping an entire screen. Got a question for you. Mm -hmm. Does LEAS and LEAU affect the zero flag? I think they do. I'm not sure. They do no, not. They do not. Ah, interesting. Yep. So. Because those are used for pushing and pulling information off the stack. And they didn't want that to affect the stuff. So you have to remember X and Y will affect the zero flag, but the uh, S and, and U will not. And I've seen people get mixed up because I've seen infinite loops because somebody was using the U register to count some number. I, I did that once. <laughs> yeah, I've done it too. Yeah, so you, you got to be careful. Okay. All right. And let's go to that final slide. So we're doing okay, Stevie. We didn't. We're doing good. Okay. Uh, basically, that is it for the addressing modes right now. We'll get into more how to use them and how effectively. But that's pretty much the whole gambit as far as addressing modes, especially when it comes with the index. And as you can see, Steve, they're really powerful. They give you lots of options to do things. Yeah. Now. In our next instruction, in next lesson, we're going to look at the last instructions that I haven't covered, like the multiply command and um, exchange and transfer and other things, it's just going to move information around inside the CPU. So we will have covered in our 10th lesson all the instructions and addressing modes, more or less, in the 16 line. There's a couple of things I'm going to go over, which has to do with interrupts and hardware. And we'll cover those as we actually cover inter interrupts and hardware. 
and let's see then we're going to get into actual doing some coding and this is part of the show where i can't say how much i'm enjoying paul's long branch never series out there on you out there on uh youtube and like that it mm -hmm. is a great series he is i don't know if he calls it episode zero or one actually will allow you to get set up with doing assembly on your computer and i highly recommend going to youtube look for long branch never mm -hmm. I, I have a link to that i'll be showing when we get to the news uh Good. segment today because we're going to use his model also for our classes i figure that's the best thing he's got a series going what he's got set up for doing assembly language we're actually going to be writing on the pc we're going to use emulators on the pc and then we'll eventually get the code inside of a coco but this is the fastest way for people that have modern computers to get down and get dirty with a little bit of uh 6809 goodness there you go 6809 goodness i like that yeah <laughs> I, I, I like to use the 60 uh, os9 assembler myself but all right well all right well how about we do this how long have we been doing this now it's been an hour We've been yeah. into the show for an hour now. Well, thank you, Steve, for all of that. It was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. and I just want to add one more thing real fast. Uh -huh. Once we get less, less than 10 in, this has been the plan all along, Stevie and I are going to work together. We're going to take the slides, make them available as a PDF, and also put all the different segments together in one video. There we go. And uh, so look for that coming to a YouTube channel near you. <laughs> um yeah so we're gonna take a break here in just a second but yeah this has been a great little segment and i'm glad we got paul here because we're gonna be talking about long branch never and, and setting up an environment which i'm about 80 percent through so we'll hold the questions and comments until after the break but everybody good everybody in the panel good so far mm -hmm. yeah yep I think, All right. I think Steve I'm, Jones is doing an outstanding job explaining all of this. All right. And James Jones says, "Applause, well done, Steve." Um, yeah, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of sidebar chat going on during the whole presentation, and so we'll we we'll look at some of that when we come back. All right. So we're going to take our first uh, brief break. So smoke them if you got them, potty if you have to. We'll be back here in just a minute. We are back, everybody. We are back with hey, Coco I, Talk. I, I have something. Uh oh, Ron has something. Is there a cure for it? I have. I have a like an overview of what we just went through. An overview. Yeah, and w what we have here is uh, uh, the X, Y, and U registers here. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm. Uh, this is my pointer. Okay. And um, I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to use a direct mode. <laughs> and I'm going to grab a cookie, and I'm going to take it from an effective address, and I'm going to push it And then it you're going to load it immediately into your mouth. It, it's off the stack, okay? <laughs> and uh, I'm going to jump to uh, index my decrement. <laughs> I, I think Steve Bjork can now retire. You've basically summarized everything in, in just the Oreo cookie analogy. It's Oreo. It's cocoa. 
<laughs> All I can say is when you're done with that analogy, the code's going to look like cookies and cream. <laughs> This code's a little crummy. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to go there. I was not go. Oh, so a Curtis screensaver. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I took notes. <laughs> Ron took notes. Is that notes or a shopping list? No. On, on the presentation or on the cookies? What did you take notes on? On the presentation. Okay. Um, long branching never. <laughs> now i was scanning through the comments and like that and somebody said gee when would incrementing by one be useful when you're trying to write two bytes or something like that and it's not and actually when they wrote made the sixty-eight thousand, you can't do that the auto incrementing auto decrementing is automatic if you're referring to something that's eight you know a byte Eight bits, it increments by one. If you're referring to something that's 16 bits or two bytes, it's uh, referred to as a uh, auto decrement by two. In other words, the instructions smart enough to know should it do it once or should it do it twice. In the case of the 1609, not quite so much. I will mention I have seen it used as a trick uh, if you need to overwrite a byte. Um, in some special cases, there's about one or two cases in, in base code and there's one or two cases in one other program I was working on. Like it's very rarely used, but there is a couple of times where I've actually seen it used effectively, but it's, it's, it's rare. Yeah. It's just, it's something as you as a programmer have to keep track of. So you want to use either two pluses or two minuses when you're talking to 16 bits or two bytes of data. And if you're just talking to one byte, you single use a single plus or a single minus. One bite. Mm -hmm. One bite of a cookie. There you go. <laughs> right. One bite. That's and right. so um, Al and Hartman. The bits that fall are called bits. Yeah. yeah. Al Hartman said if you were doing 16 uh, bit, it would be a double stuff Oreo. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, how does the milk dunking the cookies, how does that How does that fall into assembly? Well, that's an indirect mode in that exactly. case. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't. The cookie in the milk before it hits your mouth. It doesn't yeah. directly go into your mouth, right? Yeah. <laughs> Coke does not go well. Yeah, no, life is like a bag of cookies. Yeah, that's the that's new Forrest Gump quote. Assembly is like a bag of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know I, I, I do know. I do know that this lesson was definitely a little more technical than the ones in the past. But once again, this is just, and you know, an offset of the processor. It's just the way the processor is designed. It was a fairly complex, and we'll better explain it when we get into the coding yeah so it's also a longer lesson but but there's so many index modes on the 6809 if you split it you kind of forget what you learned last week and it, it was better i think to group it all together even though it was a longer lesson than normal supposedly there's like 1400 uh different variations of instructions on the 6809 and i would say that a good 80 percent of those is because of the different styles and flavors of the index addressing mm -hmm. Yeah, and which registers you're using, and whether they're indirect or non-indirect, and et cetera. Exactly. So if you take a look in the Motorola programming manual or in Leventhal's book or any of the 609 books, you'll see they usually have a table of just covering all the index modes and all the different permutations it has. And then when you add the in index addressing, it almost doubles it. So it's just, you know, for an 8-bit processor, having that many different instructions was very unusual. I mean, the 6502 had less than 256 instructions. So, yeah, it's, there, it, there it, you it, have it. it it's but very the 6809 is not the king of the heap, though. The 6309 is. With <laughs> We're not talking about that in these. <laughs> that's, know, that's the second second batch. That's of the next day. Yeah. Well, see, if we had included all the 60. 309 instructions, DV would have long time ago went boom. <laughs> Plus, we want to start with the CPU that everybody has. I mean, not everybody has a 6309, so that'll be like a, a separate set of lessons. It's just like Barry was mentioning about using OS9 assembly. There's some things you do a little bit differently because of the way OS9 works, which I would like to do a series on later on myself uh, to help people with that. But it's we want to concentrate on the core that everybody has. Everybody has a 6709 in a Cocoa. 
or emulated one. Uh, not everybody has OS 9, not everybody has a 639. You just start most somewhere. People, start yeah, most people, it. when they want to write a, a program or game, they want it to work on the most computers and like that. That's the reason why, you know, some of the stuff that I wrote in the past, it, it works on all three Cocos. Uh, of course, Ark and I was unusual because not only did it work on all three Cocos, it understood the difference and actually graphically did two different versions. So we will not get into that for a while. In the Very last. impressive program, by the way. I thoroughly enjoy playing Arkanoid from time to time. It's one of my daughter's favorite games, too. I have to admit, it was one of my more favorite ones to work on. That and Rampage. Hey, Al Hartman's asking, is the Hydrox cookie the 6309 instructions? If Oreo is the 6809. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Chad Cunningham says you look a little bit like Jeff Bridges, Rondelvo. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. A Hydrox cookie is more like the 6803. 68. Not quite as good. <laughs> Not <present. laughs> Which one are the chips ahoys? <laughs> Which came first? All anyway, right. I'm going to have to get out of here pretty quick. So I'm just wondering if there's okay. any questions from chat or from the panel or anything else that you know I might help answer along with Steve. El Diva, El Diva Boyle wants to know. Yes, questions? please bow down before me and ask any yes. questions before. Yes. Do you have questions a ring? or comments? Do you have a ring to kiss? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> ring you know i was going to comment on the uh, on the code diff basically the code difference for os9 is pretty much you need to write position independent code and reference the data area off of the u register where your data is stored because your program and your data area can move around in memory so in order to find where your program is or not or actually not find where it is but you just don't care where it is you reference you write it your your code is position independent code you use long branch instead of jump, et cetera. And for finding your data, you usually reference your data loads off of the U stack as an offset to find where your data is stored. Well, I always like to know where my cookie is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, towards the end of the assembly language lessons, I'll be working with Curtis and we'll actually have a segment on how to write for OS 9. Okay. Yeah. And eventually I'll do an entire series on it too. So, yeah. But, um, when you guys uh, make a program or whatever, are you going to have that available to download? Yes, that will be available to download. Uh, cool. Curtis, you're going to be able to kind of watch the show while you're traveling for a little bit, right? Uh, not watch. I'll be able to hear it. Or hear it, at least. Well, um, I see that David Ladd's with us. We'll work with him so he can definitely take Stevie uh, uh, up a few notches on DEF CON. Okay. Just throwing a whole bunch of acronyms. Um, yep. Yep. I just didn't want you to miss out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. With that, I will say goodbye because it doesn't sound like there's any okay. further questions that I, I might be able to help with. So I'll listen to you guys on the road until I run out of cell phone service and catch the okay. show on video replay later. This concludes another episode of Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to CocoTalk at CocoTalk.live. CocoTalk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because CocoTalk is rocking the 8-bit world. Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, click the Patreon link at our website at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, crew, and contributors. Thanks go to Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, Mark Overholzer, Grant Leedy, Bruce Moore, Nick Marentes, Ron Delvo, Rick Adams, Jason Riker, Richard Lorbieski, Jim Brain, Tom C., Rob Inman, Mark Bosley, Brian Joyce, Ken Riker, David O'Connor, Brian Weasler, Terry Steggy, Nick Marota, John Strong, and many more, especially to Steve Bjork for production suggestions and James Diffendaffer for making my head explode.
Please help support the COCO community by visiting some of its various contributors. A list of resources is available at imacoconut.com. That's I-M-A-C-O-C-O-N-U-T dot com. The Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Sheeler. Mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore.